Good evening, everyone, and welcome back to another episode from the Scale Up Thursday series. My name is Rashmita, and I am the event planner for Microsoft Reactor India. I'm here today joined by our very own host, Vivek, and of course, our special guest speakers, Sanjeeva and Nuan. But before we begin this session, I would request you all to read our code of conduct. We are all here to learn together, so please be respectful of other people's views, understanding of differences, being kind and considerate in the way you engage. The chat section is open throughout and we do encourage you all to participate. Our speakers will answer all your questions during the session. So please feel free to drop all your questions in the chat section. But before I hand over the show to Vivek, I would request you all to scan the QR code. It's a quick way to learn about the Microsoft for Startups Founder Hub program and how Microsoft for Startup team supports startups. They provide access to great AI services, expert advice, and the necessary tech to build a future-proof startup. With this, thank you all once again. Enjoy the show and let me bring in Vivek. Hey, Rashmita, thank you. Thank you for, uh, for this introduction. And um, hey, all, welcome back to Scale Up Thursday show. And um, I know this is the third edition of this, and uh, this is the first episode uh, of the third edition, and we are going to have more as well. And uh, let me, you know, invite uh, our guests, uh, even before I invite them, uh, let us know from where you are joining us in the chat. Just go ahead and uh, share from where you're joining. And while you're typing that out, uh, I'm going to bring in uh, Sanjeeva and Nuan. Hello, Sanjeeva and Nuan. Good evening. Hi, Vivek. Good evening. Thank you for hosting us. Good evening. OK, so welcome to the show. And, uh, and, and, and Sanjeeva, I have to tell you, um, I was doing a couple of research about you, you know, how to introduce you uh, to the audience. And literally, I was like, wow, oh my God, what, what, what is this? <laughs> you know? uh, I mean, how do I introduce uh, in a person like Sanjeeva? Like, you know, it's so many things you have done. Um, let me start. OK, I've, I've opened the, your LinkedIn page and uh, your LinkedIn profile, in fact. So, I'm looking at this, and you are being a visiting professor. You are your research staff member in IBM. Um, I I know what that means because I was working for IBM as well. So I mean that's a you know, that's a huge honor to meet you uh, as a research staff there. And you've been a founder. You've been a you know uh, you you've been a founder uh, to two companies uh, already before WSO2 and you've been in army, you've been a Uber driver. I'm going to talk about that uh, in, a, uh, in, in some time, but, and you are also the member of Apache, uh, you know, uh, software foundation and bunch of boards, uh, some colleges, you're part of the, some of the colleges, working committees and, um member of uh, Sri Lankan Software Foundation and then uh, 18 years into uh, WSO2 okay this was this was very difficult for me to introduce right <laughs> so uh, Nuan uh, you too uh, I see that you know uh, 12 years into uh, WSO2 and you know you've been you started with career with the WSO2 I believe like Five years before you had, you were working in info, uh, information science uh, technology company, and then you moved into WSO2, and you've been there for long. And I think you've built uh, the complete uh, uh, open source stack for WSO2, right? Uh, that's interesting. And welcome to the show. And I'm, I mean, um, I would let Sanjay to introduce yourself as well uh, in a shot, <laughs> and then one you could do. Uh, but I, this is what my introduction is. All right. Well, thank you very much. Um, so great to be here. Um, I'm very happy to talk about the topic we're going to talk about. My personally, I'm uh, I'm a technical guy. I run a company, but I don't really run a company. I, we have uh, 
we, the company runs itself through formulas for the most part. Um, uh, we have a great team that runs different parts of it. Uh, my personal passion has always been in creating technology. And I've been working on that now for 30 plus years. Uh, I, think, uh, I think I finished my bachelor's degree in 1988. So now, geez, that's 36 years ago. Uh, PhD in 94, that's 30 years ago. And uh, I'm also an open source person. I'm also very Sri Lanka passionate. I lived in the US for 16 years, came back to Sri Lanka in 2001, been back home now for 23, uh, 22 and a half years, and uh, started the company to make some points about what is possible from this side of the world. Fantastic. I think you won. Hey, thank you for having, having us, uh, Vivek. So, so yeah, like you said, I uh, practically started my career at WSO2. Uh, been a part-time, uh, or rather, I was doing uh, studying before WS2 at a company called Informatics, um, working in the telco and insurance space. That was while doing my bachelor's, so that was for five years. And as soon as I completed my bachelor's, I joined WSO2. So yeah, uh, been passionate about open source. Uh, joined as a software engineer uh, to the WSO2 ESB team back in the day, and then um, then I was transferred to the WS2 API manager team. This is again like an open source piece of software that is API management stuff. Uh, so I've been leading that product for a while and now I focus on uh, this uh, new stuff that we are building called Corio. So yeah, my entire career practically has been here in WSO2. Uh, yeah, and uh, based in Sri Lanka. Yeah, I, I think that's, uh, that's wonderful. And um, I'll come back to the main question uh, to you, uh, Sanjeeva, that is, um, We'll talk a little bit on that because I want to understand about your Uber driving experience you know, as an <laughs> Uber driver. <laughs> and why did you do And in fact, for the audience, if you go to his profile, LinkedIn profile, uh, you can actually find it as a blog. You can read that blog. Um, I hope uh, I can share this as well. You should be reading that. But what, you know, Sanjeeva, go ahead and, you know, uh, just. And it's very important because I'm bringing this up is because, you know, everybody knows how to, you know, we can talk about building startups, we can build, you know, talk about building great tech products, but it is like how to be an amazing human is, is something, you know, uh, is what it makes us all great, right? So uh, go ahead, Sanjeeva. Yeah, so so Uber driving, I, I, I was always curious about how it worked and so forth. And... You know, we in Sri Lanka, and I'm sure, and I know India is similar culturally in many, many ways. Uh, we look at, we have a hierarchical system where look, we look at people's job as defining who people are and the value they are and so many things, right? That's very unfortunate, but that's the reality. Um, and whereas you go to the US, you go to UK, you go to Australia, a driver is somebody who provides a critical service and they call you by your first name and you call them by their first name. and they get paid a fair living wage and life goes on, right? Bus driver in particular is a very important job because they have 50 people's lives in their hands uh, and they are treated very well. Uh, and in uh, in Sri Lanka, certainly they're not. So I, I wanted to make a point that when you drive, when you get into a car and somebody's your driver, don't treat them badly, basically. Don't treat them like they're second class. Uh, and so I, I chose uh, uh, to become an Uber driver to make a point about that, just to kind of drive and then I, I did it periodically, and I'll, I'll get back to that in a second. But um, it, and it was funny because the first time I, you know, I, I wrote all my experiences in yeah, the first time experience I think you Brown. It was quite interesting. It's quite challenging to get over the hump of actually I'm going to drive somebody and you know I'm going to take their responsibility and drive them. It, intellectually, it was like I got to get over it. Once I got over it, it was completely fine, you know, and taking random people in your car and taking them wherever they want to go. Yeah. Uh, I think the lowest I earned was less than a dollar for driving like 10 kilometers because the guy had some kind of a discount code and, and uh, like 200 rupees at the time. And it was like at 10 a.m. I had to go to the northern end of Colombo, which is like a different area from, you know, it was an interesting time. But um, the, the point is, a, 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 so you learn that, and I've taken a few people who recognize me and who like, like you know, then they're like uncomfortable and nervous and they talk a little bit, right? But most of the time, people talk in the car, they completely ignore the driver. So you hear all kinds of interesting stuff about what's going on in their life, you know, all the fights they're having, all the good stuff, uh, and so forth. But but the point is, a one of the failings of at least Sri Lanka culture, and I think India, uh, I, I don't know, I'm not going to comment on that, but certainly in Sri Lanka, is that we have this 
uh, hierarchical mindset and I want to break it because I find that terrible and it's really and we in WSU for example everybody calls each other by their first names there's no sir madam there's no hierarchy I don't get a bigger seat or a bigger desk uh, none of us have officers we sit wherever we want to sit and we, we create this flat model right whereas in a typical organization here uh, the CEO will have their own bathroom they won't eat at the same table they won't use the same fork and knife and spoon or plate and cup you know all that nonsense is just that's not the way you create uh, you empower innovation from random people you, you know the, who, who the person is is not relevant their idea and their ability to come up with an idea deliver and execute an idea is all that matters and this is just one of those ways of making a point publicly yeah i, I think I mean, it's truly inspiring and uh, definitely a point taken and and probably uh, for all the people who have joined in you know you should definitely go back and read that uh, blog which have uh, we have just shared in in the comment and uh, so so let, let's get back to wso2 now and um, let, when did you start that wso2 so started in 2005 um, so let me just give a little bit of background up to that point so i came back to sri lanka in 2001 uh, in fact, even way before that, I had been, I, I was in the U.S. from 1985 as an undergrad. While I was a grad student, I volunteered to help run email to Sri Lanka. So I, along with several other people, used to run all the email uh, facilities, uh, all, basically deliver all the email to Sri Lanka. I had a small old computer. Everything would come there. We would make a phone call every day, deliver email. So I, when I came back, I, I knew a bunch of people here. And at the time, there was a focus on, on uh uh, free and open source software, FOSS. Uh, uh, Vivek, you're still in the show, right? I, we don't, I don't see you. But oh, you don't? Okay, okay, now you're back. Okay, all right. Yeah, just making sure. Yeah. So uh, I, I was saying that that uh, there was a lot of interest in people using free software. At the time, Microsoft was the evil evil side, right? Where, you know, there was the free software, the open source movement, and there was Microsoft on the other side. And there was a lot of fighting back and forth saying, you know, open source bad, you know, blah, blah, blah. Uh, but the, the focus when I, when, I, when I returned to Sri Lanka was, was the LK Linux user, Lanka Linux user group, LK Lug. Lugs were the main uh, FOSS, the Linux user group's the main thing at the time. And their thing was, don't use Windows, use Linux. And my thing was, what is the difference? You're taking a drug from Redmond versus uh, wherever in North Carolina, Red Hat was it at the time, right? You're not creating. You need to be a creator. So we started a foundation called Lanka Software Foundation, which was basically saying, why can't we create this stuff? It's open source. Open source is a new way of doing things. And that's how we started, basically. And then we did some work there. And then the company was started because I actually had no interest in starting a company. I was a research guy. And I couldn't get anybody to start, uh, start a support business on the product. Nobody was interested here. And, and and finally, the, the, a couple of us said, why the hell don't we start a company? And then we started figuring out, what does that mean? How do you start a company and all this kind of stuff? We had no idea at the time. And uh, ended up starting a company in 2005. Fantastic. I, I think, you know, um, I mean, that is the pre-WSO2. And when, when you started the company, WSO2, uh, why did you, you know, come back to that uh, open source and, uh, what was your first product there? Yeah, so um, we um, we had a, from day one, WC2 had a crazy vision. The vision was we're going to become the number one middleware company in the world, right? And I have a, I had a middleware background. My entire technical career from the time I was an undergrad was working on building tools for other people to do stuff. So mm -hmm. I've been, you know, I was never involved in the application creation, all this is tooling, creating tools, some kind of runtime, some language, and so on for doing things. And so my interest was very much, uh, and even I joined IBM, I was basically working on that. I co-authored most of the original web service specifications, WSDL, BPL, a bunch of other stuff, and did a whole lot of open source implementation work. And we did open source work. In fact, uh, we were working very closely with Microsoft. IBM Microsoft defined most of the WS star specifications. And there was a small team from IBM, WS, from uh, uh, IBM and a small team from Microsoft. So I, I was on the IBM side. and. The, we we knew the way to compete with Microsoft was uh, because IBM typically you know they'll write a spec they'll release a and I don't I'm not trying to disparage IBM wonderful company but you know they're very uh, slow 
in, in implementing. So we basically, the day the spec was, the SOAP spec was announced, uh, we announced an open source implementation. Even Microsoft was surprised at the time. This is in 2000 and, or 1999, I think. And, and you know, me and three other guys got together and hacked it out in like three days or two weeks of like nonstop, no sleep, just getting it done, right? And getting approval from IBM to release it open source. That's how Apache SOAP was created. So open source, the power of open source is that it allowed us to reach the entire global market with no marketing. So if you're going to build a company okay. out of Sri Lanka and take on, you know, at the time we were taking on IBM and Oracle. They were the two big enterprise companies. Today, we don't really talk about them as largest enterprise tech vendors, but those days they were. How do you compete with them? We have no marketing budget, right? I was basically build a better product, give it away free and see what happens. Fantastic. <laughs> I think, I mean, that is how open source actually came into picture. And, and also, um, you know, Sri Lanka is was big on Apache Foundation and all an Apache Foundation coming into picture from Sri Lanka. And uh, I know there were a lot of uh, developers on Apache Foundation from Sri Lanka as well. Um, I think that was the part of the open source world. But what were the challenges for you uh, when you thought about the company and in 2005 and when you started and uh, up to, you know, up to a certain point where you were able to scale the company? Uh, what were your challenges um, uh, from a non-technical perspective and also technical perspective? What were your uh, challenges. Yeah. Um, so from a, uh, you know, I, I would say a lot of the challenges are non-technical. Uh, you know, first thing is you're building a product out of a out of an environment that nobody knows as a place that makes products. And at the time, there was a war going on in Sri Lanka. So the only time you heard about Sri Lanka was if the bomb went off somewhere. Uh, and so, so the you know, when when I would talk to investors, they're like, "Oh, Sri Lanka. First of all, either they haven't heard of it, or they ask where it is." And they say, or, or they say, oh, that's where a bomb went off recently. Right? So not a good story for going and pitching for getting money from somebody. Uh, so really, it was a perception uh, perception challenge more than anything else first. Saying so you can build a tech company from this side of the world. Nobody had done it at the time. Uh, India had great uh, technology delivery companies uh, at, at that time, but not many, uh, or I would say probably say not any enterprise software technologies at the time. There was one company called Prometheus Technologies that built a J, J2E application server. But unfortunately, that product never took off. They, they went on a proprietary model. JBoss was open source. They lost completely to JBoss, basically. I think Prometheus is still around. They became something else. Uh, or they were bought by someone, I can't remember. But uh, so there were no... Uh, so getting, getting the mindset saying, hey, we can build a, a world-class enterprise technology company from the side of the world was the biggest challenge because that had an impact on getting customers, that had an impact on getting funding, ability to scale up, all of these things. Um, uh, technical challenges, you know, we we had done. We I had two people who were my co-founders, uh, and we we knew what we were doing on the technical side. Uh, we had a you know in the first slide deck that I made for the in first angel investor, we had three products that we were going to build, and we said there's ten more on the roadmap. Which is not normal startup. You know, startup is supposed to build one product. And I've, I've had, you know, this has been our model saying we are going to build this platform. We're not a product company, we're a platform company. And a platform has many pieces to the puzzle. You can't build a piece of it and say you're done. Of course, the platform has evolved over the years, right? So it's not what we need today, it's not Good. what we needed back, you know, almost 20 years ago. Um, so we started with that model and we, you know, we started creating stuff. Our first product we shipped was something called Web Services Application Server. Um, in fact, uh, originally it was called Tungsten. Then we made a branding change. Uh, we, we had our first three products were Tungsten, Tellurium, Titanium, and Tellurium. And, and that was because the, the, the chem, chemical sim, symbol for Tungsten is W, and W was from WSO2. And then after a while, we realized we're going to run out of T-based chemicals to name products with. And plus, we ourselves are getting confused by which one is tungsten now, which is tellurium, which is titanium. So we gave up on that and went to WSO2 application server, WSO2 ESP. But the first product that really worked well for us was the ESP. Application server was like a better Tomcat. And yeah. we got hammered for calling it a better Tomcat. Um, but it, it was um, uh, the ESP was the one that really took off as our first product. I, I think you have an interesting story behind WSO2 naming of the you know your company as WSO2. 
you know do you want to share that with the uh, with sure the so uh, when we named when we started the company uh, i wanted to call the company serendipity because that is an that's an old name for sri lanka uh, and uh, but serendipity.com was not available and back in 2005 you start a company you need a .com today you can have .xyd .io .ai .whatever right this tld explosion hadn't happened at the time so dot com was not there that means you can't use it so we then we call it serendip systems serendip also is a name used for sri lanka sometimes uh, and we registered serendip systems dot com dot org dot net dot everything that was there at the time we registered the company in the us as serendip systems we registered the company in sri lanka as serendip systems then james clark who was our angel investor said i don't like that name you got to change the name otherwise i'm not transferring the money to you guys so the, he said that on like friday that the money was supposed to be transferred on tuesday so we had a weekend to come up with a new name and we wanted a name that had a semantic to it so we tried and of course uh, you know you're going to pair.com those days checking is the domain name available and that was a precondition and then uh, you know through a bunch of uh, you know coming up with random things web wso2 stands for but uh, sorry came from but doesn't stand for web service oxygen ws web service oxygen o2 that's why the 2 is dropped in the name and and also the oxygen concept fit with our business model which was we are going to give all our code away free and we give you support so it's like oxygen is a form of life support that's why in the middle of the logo you have a heartbeat sign in the o because a heartbeat representing support that's good that's, that's fantastic you know i mean any founder who is watching this you know you know you while you are getting investment you you, you need to change your name as well you know <laughs> and that's the thing that anyways <laughs> But, but after that we had many people coming and saying ah we should change the name i had a very simple answer <laughs> that. i still have a very simple answer the moment you show me that hey com- customers are not buying our stuff because of the name i will happily change it until then no <laughs> yeah it, it's you can do it only once <laughs> yeah. that is that's a learning for all of us as well cool and now um and it's been a wonderful journey after that you know you built so many products um and it has uh, really helped and we are going to go through some of the products and we will see a demo of the the products as well in the show um currently what what is your uh, state of business and what are those products which you have and uh, what is your vision uh, going forward for uh, wso2 okay uh, so we uh, let me just give some numbers just to get started we uh, ended last year at 89 million dollars in arr uh, we grew 16% year on year which is not a great growth rate but we are profitable and we have uh, we are cash flow positive and we are profitable and we are looking to grow about 20% this year so we are going to cross 100 million this year we closed i think 94 million dollars in bookings so we are in the 90s we need to get a few more runs and we'll be at 100 which is a very important number but it's just a number along the way uh, we have customers in uh, about 90 just over 90 countries uh we have 700 plus paying direct paying customers maybe another 4 5000 oem customers uh if you there's a whole bunch of brand names that people are aware of but i, I don't think i'm allowed to name them but if you if they you use you don't know use our software basically and we anchor uh, we anchor critical infrastructure globally for lots of different systems and institutions uh banking all across the world uh, travel government i think 37 different countries critical infrastructure runs on wso2 software uh, including india we have major banks a uh, lot of government stuff in india uses wso2 stuff a, and we have uh, 750 people in the company people are operating in 18 different countries now sri lanka is the anchor uh, country i think about 600 and uh, something are here so but 80 plus percent are in sri lanka that shifted over the years we were 99% in sri lanka and so slowly it's kind of becoming more and more global we have a small team in india we are actually hiring more people in india as well we are setting up an office in bangalore uh, we are recruiting right now to get about 20 people in india and a, um, a, and and we on the product side we have over the years evolved into the foundational technology for digital transformation so and we call and that really comes out in three forms one is api management because apis are the fundamental asset of anything digital basically second one is integration because we, when you sell to an enterprise uh, enterprise has everything already in various places so anything you do involves integration 
new APIs, new functionality. It's all evolving integration. And the third one is identity access management, uh, uh, both customer focused and workforce focused. And that's very important because in today's world, security is an integral part of any system that you have to build. And one key aspect yeah. of the technology we built is that security credential flows all the way through the software. So that was an essential right. part. Of, that's how we got into that space and why we got into that space. Because we realized that you can't build an enterprise middleware stack and say, I don't know who's using this. You need to know who's using this all the time. And then those three products are kind of the three anchor pillars of any digital transformation infrastructure in any business. And so we sell those right. three are all available as open source. Uh, we'll of course run it for you in a private cloud on Azure or something else. Uh, we will also, um, for IAM, we also have a, a SaaS solution called Asgardio, right? It's like an Okta competitor, basically, uh, same kind of functionality. And it does everything you have in the identity server product is available in SaaS as Asgardio, right? And then, then we have a new product, which uh, no one is going to talk about in demo when we, when we get to it, which is Corio, which is a completely different kind of thing. It's not a technology product. It is a... It is a platform for enterprise software engineering. So if you are either a startup or, or a full-scale enterprise, um, you the amount of effort it takes to go from the code the developer writes, for the code to go from the developer's fingertips to get it all the way into the fingertips of the customer on a phone, there's a lot of work that happens in between. You build it, you deploy it into multiple environments, you might run security scans, you have integration, you have security load testing, you have multiple environments, you have set up observability, you have set up all this infrastructure. Corio puts all of that into a box and says, just write the code, commit the code, we take care of everything, right? And the other end, you get a URL. So it's a complete platform for software engineering and it's enterprise software engineering because it is not just the problem of one developer writing code. You have a company, 20,000 developers. How do you share functionality? You need a marketplace or to enable reuse and discovery. We build all of that in Corio. Perfect. So to summarize, uh, there is a developer and then there is infrastructure and in between uh, there is WS4 all offerings, which is platform, uh, which is taking care of all those things, which is required from an infrastructure pers perspective. And as just a developer, you just go there and uh, work on these things and you don't really need to worry about the you know, platform and the infrastructure integrations. Those integrations is done by WSO2. So, I mean, I'm summarizing it. I think that's, yeah, that's yeah. the summary, right? Yeah. <laughs> okay. Perfect. So, uh, before we di deep dive into the uh, the platform layers and other things, I have one last question to you. You built a company in Sri Lanka. How did you take it to global? So, um, it wasn't. Uh... It wasn't a company that we built in Sri Lanka and took global. From day one, we wanted to be global because we were building on top of open source infrastructure. We were very strong Apache contributors. We knew how to build global, both build global software because open source had taught us that, that you can have a global team and build software. Second, uh, uh, second day, we, we knew that you have to get customers globally. In fact, our first customer was eBay. They bought a support contract from us Without a, a contract, they paid through PayPal. $2,500 they paid with the PayPal transfer that the guy put onto his credit card and his manager approved. And we delivered 10 hours of support for them. Right? That was our first income we had from anybody. So, so we, we wanted to go after a global market and we knew the technology that we were creating was completely globally relevant, wasn't a Sri Lankan thing and so forth. In fact, we didn't ever try to sell to Sri Lanka for a very long time because... Uh, we, we said, hey, if somebody wants to buy in Sri Lanka, we're happy to sell. But uh, sorry, one other unusual thing I should say, most of our customers have come to WSO2. We don't have a traditional field sales team going and selling. We don't have a commission-based sales model. We all our customers, most of our customers have come to us. They know our brand from, from various analysts or content we've created or, or some product they downloaded because they search for something open source, they find it downloaded. And then they fill enough contact us form and say, hey, we need some support for this product. Or we want to buy a subscription. Then we start engaging with them. And most of the selling is done online. Perfect. I think, um, and that's how uh, open source uh, helps you, right? If you build an open source, you have global developers and and suddenly somebody is uh, talking about your product and, and 
globally people will pick up this product and uh, start looking into it and uh, come to you from a support perspective and other things um so let, let's let's go back to um the platformless discussion which i you know just introduced so uh, so i'm going to bring in noan and uh, introduce us to the um you know platformless and uh, and also go about uh, you know teaching us the curio uh, what is what does it do um, i know i know that you have a bunch of products and uh, we are specifically looking into curio because it helps a lot of startups and it's you know i mean i have personally lo looked into it uh, i've seen the demo of it um, and uh, your team did a demo to me as well so it's just after seeing the demo like you know why i did not use this when i was devops head <laughs> so uh, it was so easy for me to uh, build something like this and just deploy it um you know that that's the kind of feeling i got so no one uh, uh, over to you uh, you want to share your slide uh, i can i can just bring it up yeah yeah let let me share my screen So okay. while we are bringing the screen, so anybody who has questions, uh, please uh, drop your questions in the chat and uh, we will take those questions. Yeah, so so what I'll do, uh, what I'll do is I'll, I'll walk you through a few slides of what, what we built uh, and then I'll jump into a, to the product to show you how it all works and, and explain the concepts behind it. Um, so as you know, Sanjeev has been touching up upon several times while you were speaking, um, th there's a lot of things that needs to happen in the modern day when you, you know, you know, when you have a piece of code and want to get it to production. And actually, if you observe, if you look at how, how the world has progressed in, in terms of delivering software, it's basically got complicated. I mean, yes, it, it's gone, got better in terms of scale and security and so on. But at the same time, it, it, it's got complicated, right? So if you focus a bit on the left-hand side, this picture, uh, it shows you a, a bunch of things that you need to do in order to get your code running in production. So these are things like setting up your security infrastructure, your secret management, setting up your observability, setting up the gateways, setting up the CI, CD pipelines, and all of this, right? So, but if you really think of it, not there's no organization where this is their like their primary business right every organization needs to take their, their their objective is to get their code into the hands of the their users right so but there's a lot of time that needs to be spent in the middle you know to get that done so what we are trying to do with Corio and and with Escard, you're supporting behind the scenes is to kind of streamline and standardize this process and automate as much of it as possible uh, through our platforms so you can basically focus on you know your code and and the 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 application and the experience that you want to give to your customers behind the scenes all of these things need to be done like you can't take any of these away but there are certainly a lot of things that you can standardize you know generalize and of course automate behind the scenes right so that's what we've done uh, with Corio and I'll show you how uh, some of these things work so it's basically, um, it's like, so we use the term platformless. There's a definition uh, behind it. So you can go online and read about it. Uh, so what we are trying to do is give like a serverless experience for enterprise software. You bring in your code, you deploy it to a platform, uh, in, into our platform and you get out a uh, URL which you can access, right? And of course, behind the scenes, we, we are using, um, now, this, this product has been built on Microsoft Asia. So there are uh, some a bunch of Microsoft services or Asia services we are using behind the scenes. So some of it is listed here, not everything, right, since it gets cluttered. So if you are using Corio behind the scenes, you are using a lot of uh, Asia services as well. So like I said, it's, it's not a matter of taking anything away, but rather standardizing and uh, automating all of these uh, best practices and things you need to do get to get your code into production, right? So these are some of the services we use. Now, uh, if you think of building this kind of a system yourself, this is like a very, you know, like high level blue, blueprint of what you might build uh, using these services. So if you want to build a platform for yourself, uh, <clears throat> you will have to set up like your, uh, like your, like 
like an AKS, like a Kubernetes cluster uh, for for running your services. You'll have to set up uh, something like Azure Firewall for security, a VPN gateway for uh, scanning and allowing outgoing requests, a container registry, and a bunch of other services, right? So if you if you are setting up a platform yourself, this is most probably what you will uh, set up in terms of your architecture. So the reason I'm putting this up is to show you uh, what we've done. So we've done we've, what we've done is we've taken most of these services and provided you know layers of abstractions to developers, right? So so what Corio gives you is a nice clean uh, layer of abstractions that allows you to work, but behind the scenes, you are using all of these services to get your job done. So what you will see in a minute when I jump into the product is uh, those layers of abstractions, uh, and you will see how, how we have taken them out and given developers a, a, an interface where they can focus on their code uh, and how everything happens, uh, everything is linked behind the scenes, right? So um, that's what we've done uh, with Corio. So let me uh, just uh, just before you go to demo, just before you go to demo, yeah. can you go back to the first first slide or the the fourth yeah. one which you have? Ha, huh, just can you this one? Okay, so yeah, so one of the things <coughs> which I really liked about this is there are a bunch of teams involved in doing this. Actually, if you mm -hmm. see, you know, uh, this the security, the observability, and insights has been managed by a different team. And infrastructure yeah. and application architecture is done by somebody. So one of the really interesting thing which I see uh, here is, you know, there is a code, and then there are a bunch of other teams are working together, and you know, obviously the the communication and other things. The more DevOps in process gets involved, and then code is going to the production. And what Corio has actually you know solved here is just you bring the code. And share that code with within your platform, and it does go through a flow, and it set up everything for you, and gives you a URL, and you are ready to uh, just uh, use those uh, in a you know, code in the production. And rest of the things is already inbuilt from an observability to security yep. to API management and everything, right? So which is which is very um, easy for anyone to get started and go to production. So that's the, one of the thing which I truly um, enjoyed the demo the other day as well when when I saw. Um, that's one of the thing for the community as well. You know, if you're if you're building, you know, if you're a startup and if you're building something, and you want to go live fast and you don't want to really go through all of these uh, different set of lifecycle management and different developer life cycles uh, you know management and other things uh, just go there and you know uh, use Corio and deploy it and interestingly you support all the other platforms as well right not just azure you have any other platforms any other cloud uh, and different set of uh, observability tools different set of security tools so which is an uh, interesting uh, thing as well so yeah i'm yeah. i'm happy to uh, you know uh, see the demo and uh, people who have questions right uh, you know whoever is watching this show please uh, type in the questions in the chat uh, we will take those questions uh, after the demo all right cool Thank sorry, you let, let me just add one thing. Um, uh, if you go back, to, sorry, anyone, if you go back to the previous, yeah, just go to the full screen for a second. Um, so the whole platformless concept is it builds right on what you said, Vivek. That that the idea, you know, in a, in a typical enterprise, you'll have a team doing infrastructure management, another one doing platform engineering, another one doing API management, another one doing security, and so on. But if you think about it, none of them deliver value to the customers. They're all critical infrastructure you need to set up, but it's all, you know, back office stuff as far as the end user is concerned. So Corio just gives you all of that as an inherent capability in the platform. And you just, your focus is now completely on the code you write. So that's what we mean by platformless. Of course, there is a platform, just like serverless has servers, platformless has platforms, but the focus in serverless is not on the server anymore, it's on your code. Similarly, the focus on platformless is not on the platform, it's on your code. Correct. And I mean, that's, that's rightly put, yeah. Yeah. 
Sorry, go ahead. Yeah. Yeah, nothing. I mean, All that's right. rightly put. You know, uh, it's like there is no platformless. It's not like there is no platform. There is platform. It's just like what we call serverless, right? So that's the thing. And and uh, Nuan, just uh, can you just zoom in a little bit, uh, so that people yeah. who whoever is watching on mobile phone can also see the demo. Okay. All right. So so yeah, let's let's jump into uh, okay. Let's jump into the product. So I'm I'm right now logged into Corio, uh, as you can see from here. So this is the home page of my organization. So what you see here uh, is my organization. This is my personal organization and a list of other organizations that I belong to. And and, and these boxes are basically the projects uh, that I'm working on, right? So for this uh, demo, I'm going to uh, show you uh, go into uh, one project called the reading list application project. Um, so I'm, I've chosen a small use case which uh, to build a simple application that has like one UI and and one backend service, right? So um, I already have the backend service uh, deployed in Corio, so that we can you know save some time. So this is uh, already deployed and running, and I'll first walk you through how you can okay now uh, bring in um, uh, bring in the front end piece of it, uh, the UI part of it into Corio. So to, to create uh, stuff in, so I'm inside this uh, project now, so I can go in here and create various various things in inside my project. So you can add your services, which can be, you know, of various styles. You can add your web apps, your API proxies, which you want to just basically, if you want to manage APIs that are running outside of Corio, you can use this. You can create your web books. You can schedule jobs either through a timer or through or manually. You can write event triggers, uh, <coughs> event handlers, and you can write test components as well to test the code that you bring in in Corio. So in, in this particular case, I want to bring in a web application that uh, talks to my uh, backend service that is running in Corio. So I'll give it a name. I'll call it the reading list uh, UI. Um, and then the next uh, step is to choose what kind of an application this is, right? So we have... Uh, these things called build packs, uh, which know how to build your code once you tell it what type it is, right? Uh, and we support various uh, various uh, uh, various build packs for different kinds of components. So in this case, what I have is a React uh, application, and this project is already linked to my GitHub repository. So I have to go in here and pick um, uh, what uh, what fold my application is in. So it's in this uh, directory path. So let me go ahead and select that. And then I have to give it the, the, the build command. So in this case, it's going to be npm install and npm run build. Uh, and the build uh, path is going to be dist and the node version that I have used in this application is 18. So what I've basically done is I've written the code, tested it out uh, locally in my laptop, right, and found out that it's working. And I've pushed that code into the, the my GitHub repository, and I just provided the path to it in here. So I'll go ahead and create this component. Now uh, what we are doing behind the scenes is we are creating your component. So what this means is uh, Corio is going and setting up the GitHub actions uh, that is required for running the deployment pipelines and all of those things behind the scenes, right? So that's uh, that uh, automation. There, that's that automation that happens uh, behind the scenes. Now, so my component is created. Uh, so the next step is, uh, as I said, okay, this is the UI part, and I have the backend part running. I had to create a connection from my UI to the uh, backend service. So I can go in here and click on connections. Now this basically will show me um, all the services that I have in my organization. So this is a piece that Sanjeev was talking about uh, called the marketplace. So you can now go and you know connect to stuff that has been built either by you or either by other people in your organization. This is like a central registry of all the services you have in your organization. So let me search for the backend that I'm interested in connecting to. So this is the one I'll call, give this connection a name called backend connection, right? And let me, yeah, let me go to the next step. 
So I get a URL. Uh, so I have to use this uh, in my application. And uh, I can copy this from here or from the next screen and then say, okay, finish creating the connection. So now what we, we've done, again, done a bunch of integration behind the scenes. So if you are familiar with developing apps, you know that for an app to and connect to an API, there needs to be some keys taken, some OAuth handshake done. You know, there's a bunch of things that you need to do, right? Now, but with this uh, simple connection creation, we've automated all that pieces for you. And we've actually taken a, a, a step beyond that. Even we even simplify the process of doing OAuth. So as you know, taking an app uh, and doing an OAuth handshake is not simple and straightforward. We've done some extra work to simplify that. So your app basically works based on cookies and your API is, is protected by your OAuth. I'll show you that uh, as we go along as well. And we do some stuff in the middle to simplify this process of connecting. Right? So, so now so the connection. One, uh, yeah. Just before we proceed. So basically what you did was you had a code in GitHub and yeah. you took the code and you said, well, let's deploy this code um, uh, onto the platform. Uh, which platform yeah. is what the question is. And, and there is a question in the chat. Uh, which is what is the platform uh, where it is deployed? Right. So okay. So let me step back and explain. Right. So uh, so for first of all, it's it's not deployed yet. You are just about to deploy it. So Corio is a platform which uh, which basically is a collection of tools which allows you to bring in your piece of code and run it. Right now, when we get to the deployment part, uh, the what will happen is this: uh, the the image that is being created will be deployed into a Kubernetes runtime. So Corio has two main parts to it: what we call as a control plane and the data plane. Right. So so the control plane is where all the settings are done, like all the initiation of your components are done. Which is we are right now we are looking at the control plane. Uh, this is where the UIs are. Now, once you have you know, connected your code and ask Corio to go and okay, deploy this piece of code now, what will happen is behind the scenes, we'll go and do the build and stuff. And of course, deploy that into the data plane. So the data plane is a Kubernetes cluster. It's uh, cloud agnostic. It can be in your own uh, you know, subscription of Asia. It can be on AWS. Uh, you know, it can be anywhere, right? So the the platform where your code is actually going to be running is effectively a Kubernetes cluster. Um, it's called a Corio data plane, and it can be on Azure, AWS, Google, or you know anywhere you want it to be. So, Got it. Uh, so so until now you you did a <laughs> you 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 just build this code, right? I, I actually and haven't built it yet. I I uh, you were just I initiated a... the component. Yeah, and, okay. and created a connection between this front end component and the back end component. Got it. Right? Got it. Yeah. That's, yep. Yeah. So, yeah, the, once you created the connection, there's basically some helper documentation explaining uh, to you how to use this connection in different forms of applications. So, let's go to the build part. And now is the time we are going to uh, basically ask Corio to build our code. So you can go and press uh, this button over here and it will basically show you the commits uh, in your GitHub repository. So you can pick a commit uh, and say build. Uh, now this basically starts the CI process. So uh, there, this is this now process triggering... is on the GitHub, GitHub actions in the yes, repository exactly. where we have and got it. Okay. Exactly. Right. So there's a GitHub action being uh, triggered, which is basically uh, you know, checking out your code behind the scenes, compiling it using the commands we gave. It's it's creating the Docker files. Uh, it's you know scanning the Docker file. It's uh, running the Docker build, uh, and it's um, you know after the image is generated, it scans the image for for vulnerabilities, and then finally it pushes the image into uh, in this case ACR, the Asia Container Registry. It can be you know any other registry as well. So that's that's what's happening behind the scenes now. So as you can see, the build has passed, and now the vulnerability or uh, review scan is going on. Uh, once that is com uh, completed, <coughs> we will do uh, commit some stuff to uh, what we call as a JITOPS uh, repository uh, for you know preparing this for the deployment uh, phase now. 
so the build has from been the, from completed the, from the developer perspective we don't have to write any of those github action code it's just no, i have no. written my code and given it to the uh, exactly. courier and courier is writing all the github yeah. action code and everything has been set up so you don't really have to yes. be worried on that part perfect yeah you just write your react code um, in in this case not even a docker file well you can have a docker file if you want but in this case uh, it's not a must uh, we we can generate the docker file as well so you can go and have a look at the build logs uh, and stuff if you want from here as well and you know once this part is done now the build is successful the next step is to go ahead and deploy it so when you come into this section you will see environments so this is my development environment and production environment nothing here did nothing deployed here as of now so you can have any number of environments and the other uh, good thing is these environments are you know can be on different clouds as well if you want like you can use the default data plane for development for example and you can have your personal your, or your organization specific uh, data plane for production and maybe another one on a different cloud so so these are all uh, cloud agnostic um, so you can directly deploy if you want uh, if you've done all the configurations but since this is the first time i'm deploying i'll go with uh, configure and deploy so i need to give the uh, uh, give that configuration here basically uh, tell where the uh, my service is this is the value i copied uh, when at the point of creating the connection so i copied this url and i need to give this uh, to the config file and go to the next step and this is a place where some authentication stuff uh, happens authentication settings happens so um, as I said, uh, we have some built-in authentication into Corio as well, so that you, in, in this particular case, I'm building a web app, right? So you as the app developer don't have to worry about setting up OAuth and all that stuff. Uh, we'll do, we do all of that uh, things for you. Uh, you just have to give us, give us some configuration, like, such as redirect paths and so on. Um, and that's about it. So when you say deploy, we now trigger the uh, deployment process into what we call as the data plane. So the data plane is where your workloads are going to be running. Uh, so this is the place where all your user traffic is going to be uh, coming or served. And uh, so this is where all your workloads are running. So this is completely um, you know, separate from the control plane. It's running outside the control plane uh, and it can run anywhere you want. So yeah, the app has been deployed into my development uh, environment. Quick question, uh, do I have to run this only on the Kubernetes or I can deploy it like non-Kubernetes uh, infrastructure as well or is it platforms? Yeah, specific? so <clears throat> right now it's, uh, we, we support uh, various flavors of Kubernetes only, but we do have a plan to support other platforms such as you know serverless and, and VMs even uh, going forward. Yeah, but at the moment it's uh, different flavors of Kubernetes. Got it. So, so let's just have a look at the app, you know, uh, just because it's fun. So let me copy the app URL and, and, you know, put it in here. So I can, you know, go and log into this application. So as you can see, this, this login screen is coming from Corio. Uh, so as I mentioned, we have some default authentication built in. Um, and once you've signed in, uh, you know, you will be redirected back uh, to the application. So this is a uh, this is basically a reading list app. So you can have books that you're reading, read, and yet to read. So you can go and add uh, an application. Let's say okay, uh, tale of two cities or the uh, let's see. I'm reading this. So you can go and. So this is just a sample application that demonstrates, uh, you know, just that it's 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 working. So let's go back to uh, Corio. Now you can now go back. So let me go back to the project and show you what our project now looks like, right? So if I go into this section, components and the project architecture, um, you can see what our project looks like. So this has two components. Uh, so again, this is uh, something we call this, this diagram here, we call it a cell. 
And we do, apart from infrastructure stuff, we do enforce some uh, application architecture uh, things on Corio as well. So we follow something called a cell-based architecture. You can read up on that online. Uh, we came up with that a couple of years ago. Uh, so you can see these two components uh, inside the project. So as I said, this is a very simple project, just two components, right? And it's up and running now. So you can go into this section to see what uh, the 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 logs or the observability stuff looks like uh, so i switch to the development environment the log should come up here in a minute uh, so you can get details of uh, you know observability like now this is my web app component the the ui but however here it's okay there are eight requests uh, latency of 81 milliseconds uh, in average now this is my backend component so that has had 146 requests. Uh, so backend has been running for a while, right? So that's why it's showing uh, a number of requests. Uh, so you can see all the observability data from this. So so as you can see, all I did as a developer was just bring in my code and point in and deploy. So everything from the security is built in, uh, the observability stuff is built in, the application architecture is enforced, authentication is built in. I didn't have to do any of that. Now you're seeing some logs over here. Now this is all using Azure Log Analytics behind the scenes. So data is pumped into those uh, services and all of that. So, so you can go into here, the runtime logs uh, as well, which uh, you know gives you the opportunity to search and filter through logs as well if you want. You know, look at different kinds of logs and all of that stuff. So again, in this case, powered by uh, Azure Log Analytics. So. That's about the project stuff. Now, let me also switch to the backend service to show you some uh, interesting stuff. So uh, once the, the deployment is done, we allow you to test various components as well. So there's a, there's a, like a, like a, a testing component. Uh, so you can go through different resources and test them out. Uh, so this most people have probably seen, but you also have a cool feature, which is powered by AI, which allows you to test uh, you know, talk to your API in natural language. So you can, this is like a chat GPT like interface where you can, you know, send natural language queries. So if I say get all books, for example, uh, let's see if this guy works. So it knows how to access uh, uh, what to do, right? So it's sending a request to the get uh, books resource and it's returning a bunch of data, right? So that's basically a way of, you know, interacting with your API using uh, natural language. So that's a that's a cool feature we built in uh, a couple of months ago. And apart from that, now if you want to, now this is the backend service, right? Now, if you want to take this backend service or take this API and give it to outside your organization, for example, or if you want to mess around with, you know, advanced settings, you can do that through this um, management section. So you can have a look at uh, its information. You can change the name and stuff of how it appears, right? Uh, you can go into this section called the lifecycle and uh, publish it so that outside people can. So we have a developer portal. I'll show that to you in a minute as well. So you can go and publish this to your developer portal so that people from outside your organization can come in and consume. You can look at who the consumers are. Um, and if you have interest in monetizing this service, you can go ahead and select the business plans you want to associate to it. Um, and then this piece, uh, this place is where you, uh, you know, put advanced settings such as security settings. Uh, you can do rate limiting at a fine grain level. So again, all I did as a developer, even when building this backend service, is wrote my code and the Swagger file, of course, and the Open API spec, and just pointed it to Corio. Right, all these services around it uh, are provided out of the box. So that's basically how it works. And I switch to another interesting section where there's DevOps stuff. Now, if you as a developer or as, an, as a DevOps admin want to get into the uh, Kubernetes level of configurations, like how many replicas should, should this have? What is the uh, memory utilization, CPU utilization and memory requests? Uh, you can do all of that from here. So this uh, will scale up to five uh, pods, right? And as you can see here, not a lot of CPU is used, 17% uh, of memory is used. If you want to directly go into your container logs, you can go into it from here. So all of these tools are provided out of the box. Like, so I didn't even write a Docker file, but uh, I get 
uh, this level of flexibility uh, you know to go in uh, so again some so you, uh, you you don't need you don't need to write yaml file that's the thing no no yaml yes just code yeah yeah oh, this code I, except your background picture says yaml is code yeah so okay <laughs> <laughs> we need to we need to remove that huh? <laughs> yeah, ml is no more the yeah. code, you know new yeah. code right yeah perfect yeah right. so yeah you can set up configs and secrets so again this is another place where we use um, like asa key vault for example now if you want to mount uh, a secret to your application you can do that from here uh, you can come into the devops section go to configs uh and and you know create config maps uh, using files or environment variables and we make sure that they are stored in the uh, key vault and all of that so you don't mess around with key vault or anything like that we do that for you right um so yeah that's that's basically about the 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 back end service now at a project level we also have something called usage insights so this is more of like for uh, you know uh, like business level understanding of the system now previously you, you saw uh, observability which is more like uh, you know troubleshooting for troubleshooting purposes this is more of at a business level to understand what's going on in your org so this my org is a demo org so it's it's kind of boring so let me switch to a real one which is our actual production wso2 enterprise uh, stuff so this is our uh, wso2 um, Uh, internal apps as we call it so all our applications in wso2 are running on corio and the data you are seeing is directly from that so let me switch to production uh, so so you can see okay the past 24 hours our services have had about you know close to about 35000 requests 500 errors um so this gives like an api uh, access summary you can look at okay who's talking to my Uh, to these apis what kind of client devices uh, from this graph right so this will tell you okay who's talking to my services so there are a bunch of applications talking where are my requests going to uh, and so on so there are a bunch of graphs here like you can look at what kind of errors are coming in uh, so this is saying okay most of the errors are authentication errors so there are a bunch of business related you know uh, reports here like this one will tell you what are the slowest apis in your organization or fastest apis right so slowest actually um so these kinds of information that are useful to understand at a business level the transactional stuff that's going on um and not just on on the you know observability and data but we also have some reports which tell you how efficient you are as an engineering organization right how many projects how many releases are going on how long does it take for you to get into production so again all of this is automated and coming you know uh, coming from the platform all you do as a developer is just bring in your code and plug it in right so everything is coming you know kind of like magical um and then so, finally so let j- me just to yeah. just just to summarize until now is basically you had a code and you had mm-hmm. you, first thing you did was to connect that front end build pack with the back end services you might you have yep. deployed and then yes. you go about uh, deploying everything and build it build it uh, as a docker and deploy to uh, a kubernetes cluster it can be anywhere the cluster can be on any cloud uh, so yes. the data plane uh, is basically the one which is which is external which is kubernetes cluster and uh yeah. other things and the console uh, plane which you talk about is is this console which has all the information it is getting from the data plane as well and it is basically yeah. available for a developer or the team to uh, look into all of these things and obviously uh, there are different roles uh, who have certain level of access yes. uh, to this particular uh, dashboards uh, exactly. and also yeah. kind of operations which people can do and yeah. uh, it's just you know for anybody who is building anything like any any startup who wants to just get started and they're scaling and they want to move into kubernetes and they have multiple microservices come here just you know drop in their code and it's up and running for them so yes Thanks. i mean that, that, that's yeah. that's what curio does so anybody who is watching yeah, it, that's what... uh, if you are a startup you should you should just go and use this <laughs> Yeah. yeah you touched it's up so, on so point about yeah you touched up on one important point i guess on on permission so yeah 
I, I am in admin mode, so that's why I can see, you know, go through everything. But in the enterprise, you know, the developer won't be able to go and mess up with the DevOps configs. So those kinds of, you know, features are built in. Yeah. So yep. just finally, let me also uh, show you ahead, ahead. what we have as a developer portal. So this is the, uh, so this is for like when you want to share your APIs now outside your organization, right? So we have a portal which can be branded, colored, themed, you know, and stuff. And you can push the APIs that you want in in there. And, you know, you can set up like sign up and, you know, approvals and stuff uh, through that. So this is our, our WSO2 portal. This is, I mean, this is still work in progress. We, we haven't put it outside yet, uh, but, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's clickable, but we haven't really, you know, put it outside. So you can, you can basically see our APIs that you, that, that we will expose, uh, you know, uh, soon uh, when we are ready to do so. So that's about the portal part. Um, and yeah, so so you can basically not just use this for internal consumption. You can use this system to uh, publish your APIs uh, outside your organization and get people to come and use them as well uh, and monetize them as well. We do support some level of monetization. So if you want to sell uh, APIs, you can do that from here as well. So yeah, that that's a very quick uh, overview of uh, of Corio of of the features we have. Perfect. So, um, uh, people who are watching, you have any questions? Just drop in. Uh, I know there are certain <laughs> questions uh, which I'm going to uh, bring on as well. I know that you know Sanjeeva is answering a couple of questions uh, as well, but uh, I will take a couple of questions. Uh, uh, on Korea first, and then later on, a couple of more questions which came in. Uh, one of the questions which uh, came in was uh, about the certification part. Um, you have uh, certification, and of course, uh, this question was related to it as being a complex, and you know, uh, is there any way uh, people can go and do certification and learn from? Uh, things and uh, my short answer to this is as well for a person whoever has posted this question because his name is very different uh, i can't uh, spell his name but um the uh, it looks intimidated because uh you know uh, nuan is doing a demo from an admin point of view uh, but as a user as a developer <laughs> as multiple roles in the organization log into this you will have only certain things to work on so that's one of the thing which uh, which even Nuan uh, actually shared. But yeah, um, you know, uh, Sanjeeva or Nuan, you can talk about the certification which you have for Koryo. Yeah, yeah, sure. So, so there we we do have a bunch of like like if you go to our docs, uh, there's a very you know nice and clean getting started guide. There are a couple of videos which will help you to get started. Uh, very comprehensive. Uh, documentation which explains various parts so there's a there's a lot of learning material out there a and you know you won't go through all of this when you're getting started so i obviously wanted to cover the entire platform but when you're getting started you'll be focused on a very small area uh so there's yes there is a lot of material in terms of certification uh, we do offer training on demand and you know if, if you're interested we are always open to coming in we're actually conducting a few sessions in india uh, later next month uh, for for universities uh, teaching them so we are yeah we do have a bunch of programs which help you to get started there's an open discord channel which uh, where you can ask questions and you know our developers are very active on it uh, so yeah lots of help material uh, around Perfect. And and there was a question on um, uh, vendor lock-in in terms of um, IPaaS. And, and Sanjeeva, you did answer this question in the chat, but it would be great if you could uh, just uh, you know sure. uh, give an explanation around this as well. Yeah, yeah. So first of all, Korea is not an IPaaS because an IPaaS is fundamentally about integration platform as a service. And an IPaaS is essentially inherently a vendor locking platform because you write the integration and run the integration in the IPaaS. Corio basically is an execution platform for, if you're a single developer writing a single piece of code, it's very simple, right? The code, it just runs all the way. And it just runs using stock infrastructure, stock open source infrastructure, basically Kubernetes and, and a few other things, but all uh, underlying infrastructure that you can run on your machine even. So there's no lock-in at the execution time. 
what Corio itself does, which is this thing of taking your code, building it, running the trivi scan, running all of those things that no one showed you. That is the part that Corio is doing. So if you don't, if you want to lead from Corio, your code is your code and it's written in, in whatever language you want. There is no, Corio doesn't have a language. You write in any language, you can write in Java, Ballerina, C Sharp, Node, Python, Go, Rust, Swift, whatever, it doesn't matter. And we just get it up and running in here. And so if you want to move it out of Corio, you just take the code and set up whatever CICD pipeline or DevOps platform, whatever you want, and off you go. Yep. And there is a very interesting question from Tarun. Uh, basically, when we talk about open source software, uh, I mean, what was your complexity from a gown, you know, governance and open open source license? How do yeah. you manage that? So we're very careful about this, obviously, right? From a uh, you know, open source software governance is very important. Actually, many many years ago, we wrote ourselves a tool called the License Manager, which looks at when we do a build, we go through every transitive dependency we take in and check their licenses, and we check that we have reviewed and approved the licenses. So all our products are Apache licensed. So we take Apache compatible dependencies only. So if there's a GPL dependency, we don't accept it because that's not Apache compatible. Uh, LGPL for some stuff is accepted. Apache has an exception for that. Uh, otherwise, we take Mozilla licensed, uh, Apache licensed, and a few other BSD and so forth licensed dependencies only. So we are very, very careful. We have a tool that automatically generates a readme file with all the licenses for each different component. Uh, generates all the right acknowledgements if that's what's needed because some some uh, code requires to be acknowledged that it's being used. Um, we generate the comprehensive license file that has all the licenses. Uh, so we're very careful about how we do open source license management. And we have an internal process if a developer wants to bring in a dependency, they have to uh, ask for that component basically. And then we have a review process where we check the license, make sure that it is correct. We also check other few other things like health of the project. You know, if it's a dead project, you don't want to take a dependency because then you're going to get stuck with fixing it, right? You, you generally want to participate in active open source projects and be a contributor. So th there's a bunch of aspects like that. True, rightly put. And uh, uh, one of the thing which uh, I just want to call out is uh, you have a specific program for startups and you know, startups have to go back and, uh, you know, take a look at the link, which is on the screen, you know, it's, uh, link is on the screen and link is also available in the chat. And we will also post it again uh, in the in the comments. And please go through this link if you're, if you're, you know, there are programs for startups, right? If you go back and, um, you know, take a look at it, maybe Sanjeev, you can just give a intro to what is, what program you have for startups. Yes. Yeah, so, so we, uh, what we are trying to do for startups is really help startups who want to build, say, a mobile application or a SaaS application, get them, give them the opportunity to focus just on their part of the problem. They have a problem domain they want to deliver a solution in. So, hey, write the code, but why are you thinking about how do I deploy this securely? Why do you have to think about how do I scale it? Why do I have to think about how do I build it? Why do I think about version management? All these things that you need in order to build a piece of software professionally in a professional engineering uh, architected managed way is out of the box in Korea. So you, you, if you are the founder and you're a one person startup and you just write the code, you write the code, commit it. And yes, there are a bunch of options. No one went through lots of capabilities. You don't have to use all of it, right? You don't use all of it if you're a small scale project that with a few components and it just runs for you. So the purpose of that uh, the the go the reason we are promoting Corio and Asgardio Asgardio addresses the the full B two B and B two C identity access management problem for any a, any web or mobile application that you want to build. Right. So both of those are part of the startup program, and we are encouraging saying, hey, use this. You are essentially offloading and reducing both the skill set you need to bring to the table. So today, if you're doing a modern deployment on Kubernetes or on in a cloud native kind of architecture, that would probably mean Kubernetes. That would mean some kind of uh, a, a, a 
things like service meshes possibly, all these kind of things that you want in order to build a resilient system. With Corio, all that is out of the box. That picture that uh, Nuan showed you with the, with the lines connecting, uh, that's a network trace diagram we generate using Cilium. Um, cool. a, we, we, the entire deployment is running with eBPF uh, Cilium, basically. So we get full analysis and get that all out and show it to you as a diagram. So you don't have to write a single line of code. You see which component is calling which component. Getting all that set up by yourself, of course, is possible. You need to be pretty knowledgeable. So we have a large team that has learned all that knowledge across the board and put it all together so that you as a startup can just say, hey, why am I wasting time on that? That's not helping me get a customer on the other end. Yeah, as you told, no, it's, it's, those are the things which, which is not, uh, which not bringing revenue. <laughs> the ones which are bringing revenue is the things which is, you know, which is with the customer. And, and this one is just the setups. And, you know, we just have to focus on uh, the setup. So um, is there any question from the audience? You know, you just posted uh, while, um, while we share a couple of things like, you know, the link. Uh, just go back and uh, go through this link. And thank you, uh, ABCDE to Z. Thanks uh, for joining in and uh, sharing those questions to us. Uh, that is uh, helpful. And we did answer one of the questions, which is uh, related to the language support, the programming language support. Uh, and uh, while uh, Nuwan did the demo, you could see all the build packs which were available for that as well. So and Sanjeev, Sanjeev has already answered those questions in the chat as well. Is there any other question which is uh, which is for uh, Nuwan and uh, Sanjeev? All right. Is there any question? We can wait for uh, two more minutes or three more minutes and take those questions. Uh, otherwise, I will let all of you to go back to this wonderful link and try out. And also see a bunch of other things which um, uh, WSO2 offers as well. It's not just Corio. Uh, there are a bunch of uh, open source uh, programming language, uh, Bellarino, uh, which is there. You can you can uh, try those uh, things as well. It works really well with Azure Functions. Uh, that's something which uh, I saw as a demo as well. Uh, I think we will be doing workshop uh, of those uh, in in Reactor, um, and we are going to do workshop on uh, on the uh, Curio and. We're going to do workshop on on the uh, Bellarino and everything. Uh, it's all coming in uh, so that you can learn all of these things. Yeah, let me let me just take a quick plug for Bellarino since I'm the, the original designer of the language. Uh, so we have created a programming language called Bellarino, which of course can be used in Corio. You don't have to use Bellarino, but of course it is supported. The strength of Bellarino is that it's a language designed for network-oriented computing applications. It's designed for data-oriented programming, so it, it understands data that flows over the network and processing it in the language. Um, it's a, a, a cloud-native programming language, basically, and its uh, inherent strength is on integration. It knows about talking to other services and producing services, and it's also a graphical language. Every program you write in Ballina has a natural graphical representation so you don't have to draw a picture. You get a sequence diagram representation of the entire program just by writing the program. And it's a, uh, so it's data-oriented, cloud-native, and uh, completely uh, designed for a, the modern kind of environment that we write applications in, the modern architecture. It understands, the, uh, in particular, the data model that Ballina has in the language. It's not an object-oriented language. It has objects and classes as well. But the data is modeled as data. It has a persistence model and a whole architecture for writing any kind of uh, microservices or cloud native application. And it's all open source, of course. Yeah, that, that was the one thing which I just wanted to call out. It's, it's open source. So, uh, you know, people uh, can go back and try it out as well. Perfect. I think uh, we don't have any questions coming in, but people who have questions, you know, 
maybe after going through all of these things, you might have questions. Uh, do reach out to uh, Nuwan or uh, Sanjeeva or to me as well. I connect uh, you to them as well. Um, while we are come to the end of the show, uh, I just want to thank Sanjeeva and Nuwan to uh, you know to join us, being on the show, sharing your story, sharing this demo for us and. Uh, I really enjoyed it, you know, because when I when I saw this demo, uh, you know, almost uh, a month back, and uh, when I talked about it, and I was like, wow, this is like it does everything, and and you don't need to be worried at all. And uh, if I'm building a startup, uh, and probably I might in, in future, probably this will be the uh, tool I'll go for. You know, I don't want to really manage all of those things which is uh, which has been managed, right? You know, it's it's very difficult to manage all of those uh, different platform related stuff so anyways uh, thank you for being on the show uh, both of you and thank you rashmita for hosting us uh, any any final thoughts uh, sanjeeva and no one uh... uh, vivek thank you so much rashmita thank you very much it was a great fun and uh, and we appreciate microsoft support and uh, Corio is a very uh, deeply married to microsoft technologies both uh, Azure, uh, all a bunch of Azure services, as well as GitHub. Uh, in fact, we have a strong VS Code plugin as well. So it's sort of a, uh, built on top of Microsoft infrastructure. And uh, so we appreciate all of that. Yes, thank you, Vivek. And thank you, Rashmita. Thank you. Thank you, Sanjeev and no one. Uh, and for audience, you know, just, um, you know, keep checking uh, scale up Thursday show uh, because we'll ha we have lined up uh, amazing set of startups uh, as well uh, in coming days. So we will have a bunch of startups coming onto the show and sharing their story, sharing their demos, and uh, you could basically uh, see what we are, what world is building uh, on AI on different set of uh, platforms and other things. So thank you very much for joining us as well, uh, Rashmita. Uh, maybe you do the honors of closing the show. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Sanjeeva. Thank you, Nuan. And thank you, Vivek, for hosting another amazing session at the Scale Up Thursday show. And yes, we'll be back with another exciting show next week. Keep watching Reactor website, and you will get to learn a lot more about the startups world. Thank you so much. Thank you.